card is so we can give Vikas enough time to tell us his interesting stories. So Vikas is an associate professor in our department. We were ext extremely excited to have recruited him uh, from Stanford where he was doing his residency some approximately seven years ago, roughly. Uh, because uh, I don't want to embarrass him, but I recall that Tom Insel was saying that uh, Vikas is the future of uh, psychiatry research. We wanted to make sure we captured that uh, so we had a future. And, and since he's here, we have a great future. He, uh, Vikas <coughs> did his uh, undergraduate degree at Harvard in applied mathematics, so he's able to make sure I don't go too many minutes um, longer than I'm supposed to. Then he went to University of Cambridge in UK to do a master's in mathematics, and then he was able to calculate that it was a good idea to come back and go to school at Stanford where he did his MD, PhD, and his PhD was, was with John Huguenard, who is an expert on the role of the thalamus in regulating cortical activity and the role of the thalamus in, in regulating cortical pathology, including epilepsy. Then uh, during his um, postdoctoral period at Stanford during his residency, he's one of, of, of um, Carl Dieseroth's first postdocs, or probably his first postdoc, and there, uh, Vikas did a seminal piece of work where he uh, demonstrated that parvalbumin cortical interneurons are important in regulating gamma rhythms, which we'll hear about today, are believed to be very important in, I think, in like singing within this, the brain in order to get parts of our brains interlocked and paying attention to information that's passing, passing between them. And since coming here, he hasn't uh, slowed down at all, published many papers, getting very competitive NIH grants, and um, I'll let Vikas tell us his interesting stories that he's discovered here. All right, thanks, John. Um, that was very nice. Uh, I know most of you. Um, for those of you who don't uh, know me, I've been here for about six years. Uh, my lab is over at Mission Bay, just across the way from John's, and it's been really great because I've been able to collaborate with John, um, but many other people here. I'll talk a little bit about um, a little collaboration with John um, at the beginning. Um, and, uh, and I also see patients, most of you guys know, uh, on Thursdays, um, Damien uh, lets me hang out in the early psychosis clinic, so I see some patients there as well as some in my faculty practice. So, um, again, I know most of you, but for those of you who I don't know, it's, it's nice to um, see you here and hopefully tell you a little bit about what we've been up to. Um, so I'm going to talk about circuits, uh, you know, and, and how we think about circuits in the context of psychiatric disease. And, you know, first of all, I'll just kind of motivate this a little bit. This is a poem I found that my son wrote. He um, pretty much always disappoints me with his schoolwork, but uh, this he was about to throw away, and then, like, I found it going in the recycling bin. And it, it's a perfect introduction to thinking about circuits. So he says, the best part of me is my brain because it helps me do everything. It helps me think and talk and walk. It helps me um, be smart. It helps me play. All right? So a couple things to note about this. First of all, clearly his brain does not help him spell, but that's okay. Like, overall, still very pleased with this poem. Um, the second is I think that this really succinctly um, captures what, what's amazing about the brain, which is that it's capable of tremendous, tremendous flexibility and complexity, right? So, you know, in, in those old, you know, phrenology kind of diagrams, like, there wouldn't be enough spots on the brain to enumerate all the functions that our brains are capable of. And these functions are very, very complex and multimodal. And they speak to the fact that we can't really think about particular brain regions doing things. We have to think about the brain's ability to dynamically kind of shift what it's doing and, and do many, many, many different types of tasks. And it's easy to imagine how circuits might enable that. One brain region can at some times participate with two or three other brain regions to carry out one task. At another point in time, it can kind of change the type of information processing it's doing, change what regions it's interacting with, and thus carry out a different kind of task. So, you know, I think that we kind of have to think about circuits if we're going to think about how the brain does all of these different things. 
Um, the second reason maybe to, to kind of motivate thinking about circuits is that, you know, we're very fortunate to live at this sort of like dawn of psychiatric genetics and see all these amazing, you know, discoveries that are being made, you know, by uh, many groups, and including uh, ones here. Um, and I think what many of these discoveries have in common is that the numbers are very big, right? So these numbers of, of loci here, 108 in schizophrenia, 71 in autism, these are obviously the tip of the iceberg. Um, it's kind of generally assumed there's going to be at least hundreds, if not more, you know, order of magnitude more um, genes and genetic loci that are implicated in these disorders. And at some point, you know, at, right now it's kind of great because, you know, if you're a neuroscientist, you say, oh great, here's a list of like a hundred different genes, I can make a mouse, I can study each of these genes one by one, but at some point that becomes, you know, it's, it's good for funding, it's a losing proposition for understanding and treating these diseases. And so we have to think about, okay, where do all of these different loci converge, right? Like they must, if we're going to make sense of them, hopefully we can find some convergent um, patterns or effects. And so circuits, right, uh, are places where physically many different types of neurons physically come together and contact each other. And each of these neurons obviously are going to be regulated by many, many different genes. So these are physical loci that bring together many, many different genetic loci and allow them to perhaps um, exert effects on a common target which is defined at the circuit level, right? So if you're going to think about convergence of all these etiologic factors, circuits is a natural place in which to think about that. All right, now obviously people use the word circuit to mean all kinds of different things, ranging from anything essentially bigger than one neuron to smaller than the entire brain. And today I'm going to talk about circuits at three different scales, and obviously there's a continuum of scales in between, and these scales are interrelated. But it's, it's good to think about, you know, at least a few kind of, um, you know, uh, key points um, to orient yourselves about, like, when I talk about a circuit, like, what scale am I thinking about? You can think about microcircuits, which, you know, neuroscientists generally think of as like a collection of something like a few or a few tens of cells, maybe of a few different types or ten different types. They interact, and, and you can think about these different classes as having stereotyped roles in a microcircuit, right? A microcircuit might be like a, a group of friends, you know, who, who um, all, you know, get together over and over again and, you know, have play kind of stereotypic roles in, in their uh, interactions. You can think about this sort of mesoscopic scale, which is larger than maybe the number of neurons you could count. So maybe it's something like several hundred or, or a few thousand neurons, but maybe still contained within one brain region. Um, and there are phenomena that you see at this mesoscopic scale that are, are much harder or impossible to see looking at one or two or three or four neurons, right? And then, of course, there's a scale above that when you think about many brain regions interacting. And so these are sort of this, this macroscopic, macro surface scale. The one that we think of when we think about, you know, fMRI studies or, or even EEG studies where you think about, again, like discrete brain regions that are interacting with each other over scales that are comparable to that of the entire brain, right? So I'm going to tell you about three different projects in the lab and kind of touch on each of these different scales and show you how we at least try to think about circuit behavior at these different scales and how that can be useful for conceptualizing psychiatric disease. So the first story I'm going to tell you about is really about this mesoscopic scale. And a, and a mesoscopic property of circuits is that they tend to generate patterns of activity like oscillations um, that are synchronized across many neurons. And I'm going to talk about the role of such oscillations in cognition and cognitive deficits in disorders such as schizophrenia. And this was work done by a really great postdoc in the lab, um, Kathleen Cho. She really led the project. And this was a collaboration uh, with, with John's lab. So this is really motivated by thinking about the problem we face um, constantly in the early psychosis clinic and that many of you um, grapple with, which is, you know, cognitive deficits in the context of disorders such as schizophrenia. And, you know, obviously we know that delusions, hallucinations are very salient features. They cause a lot of emotional distress, but they don't really seem to be the core of the disorder. You know, they're often preceded by a prodromal phase in which there are these more maybe subtle and more difficult to appreciate cognitive deficits that appear. These cognitive deficits are really what endure over the course of the illness and what drive declines in functioning and disability. Uh, and these cognitive deficits are, of course, currently almost impossible to treat, right? They're, they're not treated by medication and uh, any other treatments that, that may become available in the short term. You know, right now, it's, they're, they're not really widely available, and it's really unclear how well they work. So we want to understand, if we, if we think about cognitive deficits and we think about circuits, you know, where might they be coming from? And, and sort of the logic that I'll kind of go through in talking about this project is first to think about what specific cell types have been suggested to be important for cognitive deficits 
in schizophrenia? What do these cell types do? And then um, how can we think about restoring those functions um, at the level of circuits, and, and would that actually have beneficial effects for cognition? All right, so in terms of the cells that, that I'm going to focus on, I'm going to focus on these um, parvalvian interneurons. Now, this is a class of inhibitory interneurons. They've been, um, their development has been characterized by uh, John's lab and, and others. Um, these are also sometimes called fast spiking interneurons. Here's a picture of one of those interneurons from our lab. It, here's the interneuron stained um, first with biocytin, so you see its processes. Um, again, this is an inhibitory interneuron, so it inhibits uh, local uh, neurons in the, in the microcircuit. Here's staining for parvalbumin in that, in that neuron. Uh, this is just a calcium binding protein that kind of defines this class of neurons. And these neurons have what we call a fast spiking electrophysiologic phenotype. So if you excite them, if you stimulate them with electrical current, they produce this characteristic pattern of spiking in which they have very, very narrow action potentials that occur at a very high frequency and they don't really slow down over time. And this turns out to be very different than other uh, neurons. And so this is a class that's very easy to identify based on these fast spiking characteristics and based on the expression of par albumin. Okay, so it's been known for, for a number of years through work from many labs, but no, most notably David Lewis's lab, that these interneurons are abnormal in schizophrenia. And so this is an example of postmortem brain tissue and staining um, from individuals with schizophrenia as well as healthy controls. And this is staining on the top for GAD67. GAD67 is one form of the enzyme which synthesizes the inhibitory neurotransmitter GABA. And it's been known for a long time that if you look at the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex or other brain regions, that there is a deficit in GAD67 um, staining. Now, it turns out that this isn't generalized. It's not that all inhibitory neurons exhibit less, less GAD67. It seems to be fairly specific for these parvalbumin interneurons. And here you can look at parvalbumin itself and see that staining for parvalbumin itself is also reduced um, in schizophrenia. So what do these cells do? Well, many, many studies have looked at this, including the postdoctoral work that, um, that John alluded to that uh, I was kind of lucky to do in Carl Dysrow's lab before I came here. These interneurons seem to generate gamma rhythms. So gamma rhythms are synchronized rhythmic fluctuations in brain activity between frequencies of about 30 and, and maybe 100, 120 hertz. And they can be seen at many scales. So if people first saw them on the level of EEG, if you stick electrodes in the brain, you can see them. If you record from single cells, you can see them. And this is sort of an example actually from a, a cat while it's looking at a visual stimulus. And you see these rhythmic fluctuations in the local field potential, the local kind of electrical field uh, within a region of cortex when it's looking at a visual stimulus. And you see that spiking of a nearby neuron is synchronized to this ongoing oscillation. All right, so this is what's meant by a gamma rhythm. It's, it's kind of a, a phenomenon that is synchronized across many neurons, synchronizes their firing in this rhythmic way. And it's known that parvalbumin interneurons generate these gamma rhythms. Now, one of the things that's interesting about these gamma rhythms is that they tend to occur when the brain is doing something, and in particular when the brain is doing something very challenging. So in this case, you see a gamma rhythm in the, in the visual cortex when a visual stimulus is being sensed. Um, you often see gamma rhythms increase in size in the frontal cortex during tasks that require attention or working memory or cognitive control, all these cognitive functions that we associate with the frontal cortex. And so this is um, an example uh, of such a task and, and uh, its study in patients with schizophrenia and what happens to gamma oscillations in that context. So this was done by Mike Minzenberg, who, who was here until recently. Um, this is when he was in Cam Carter's lab at UC Davis. And this is a, a cognitive control task um, you know, and in this task, basically, subjects would see a, a green or a red square, and then they would see an arrow. And if they saw the green square, then they would make a movement in the same direction as the arrow. That's the easy condition. And then if they saw a red square, they would make a movement in the opposite direction of the arrow, which obviously is, is more effortful, requires cognitive control, and that's sort of the hard condition. So they recorded EEG while doing this, and they basically subtracted um, the EEG response to the easy condition from the hard condition. And what they saw was that the, the hard condition seemed to increase a greater increase in power, that is to say, rhythmic electrical activity in this gamma frequency range here between about 30 and 80 hertz. So you see in control subjects this sort of broadband, fairly, you know, non not as specific frequency, just sort of general across the gamma band increase in power when, when subjects are doing this kind of harder version of the task. And if you look at individuals with schizophrenia, you see less of that recruitment of gamma oscillations. So this is a sort of deficit in task evoked gamma oscillations. And many labs have looked at many different tasks 
involving perception, working memory, all, you know, all the kinds of things that I just talked about, and shown that these task-evoked gamma oscillations tend to be deficient in subjects with schizophrenia. Now, this leads to a fairly straightforward hypothesis, right, about one cause of cognitive deficits in schizophrenia. So these parvalvulin interneurons are dysfunctional. We know that they generate gamma rhythms. They seem to be deficient or abnormal in schizophrenia. They seem to occur during cognitive tasks. So maybe they're actually important for the cognitive tasks. And maybe when these gamma oscillations are broken, you get cognitive deficits, right? And so this is the kind of idea that I'm going to explore in the first part of this talk and really trying to nail this down. Right now, this is all just sort of correlational and hand wavy. And yeah, this is an idea, but we don't know that parvalvulin interneurons are actually involved in the pathology. They may be compensatory changes. They may be incidental to the disease process. Even if parvalvulin interneurons are involved, just because you see these changes in gamma oscillations, those might be markers for the disease process or tell you something about the health of the brain. They may not really play any causal role in cognition. So in order to get at this, we wanted to basically look at mutant mice, uh, figure out what was going on with their parvalvulin interneurons uh, and how that might affect gamma rhythms and cognition, and then see whether or not those abnormalities in gamma rhythms actually drive cognitive deficits. And in order to do this, we decided to take advantage of mice that have been characterized in John Rubenstein's lab. So these were mice that are heterozygous for two transcription factors, DLX5 and DLX6. Now, these are transcription factors that in the cortex are only expressed in inhibitory interneurons, and they seem to be particularly important for the development of parvalvulin interneurons. So we kind of hypothesized that, you know, maybe in these heterozygous mice that are deficient for these two transcription factors, maybe there would be some subtle abnormalities in the parvalvulin interneurons that would be kind of like the abnormalities that are seen in schizophrenia. All right. So this is what we find when we look at parvalvulin fast-spiking interneurons in these mutant DLX56 heterozygous mice. So this is an example, again, of the response to stimulating current in a normal fast-spiking interneuron and in a fast-spiking parvalvulin interneuron from one of these um, mutant mice. And what you can appreciate is that these interneurons are still there. They're still fast-spiking, but they're just kind of a little bit less fast-spiking. This is a, a picture of action potentials from this cell. You can see that even though the cell still fires at a high rate, the action potential amplitude goes down, the actual potential width goes up, these, these cells have slightly slower time constants, they're slightly slower to process their inputs, they're slightly less excitable, um, and, and these have consequences for the circuit. So if you stimulate these inner neurons and you record from a nearby excitatory cell and you record the amount of inhibition it gets, then in, in, this is shown for a mutant mouse here in blue and for a wild type uh, mouse here in, in black what you find is that the amount of inhibition these circuits are generating is deficient, right? They're, they're less good at generating these sorts of high-frequency inhibitory responses that we think are important for generating gamma oscillations and otherwise regulating circuit function, okay? So, so we have this mouse. This mouse seems to have a primary deficit in the function of parvalvulin interneurons, and we want to understand what the consequences of that are, is. So one interesting thing about these um, deficits, they only appear after adolescence, and of course, this is interesting when we start to think about diseases such as schizophrenia, which have this classic post-adolescent onset. So if you look at the physiology of these cells, they look quite normal up until about seven, eight weeks of age, and then about nine, ten weeks of age in mice, um, all of a sudden these cells um, become abnormal, and that coincides with the completion of adolescence and sort of early sexual maturity um, in these mice. All right, so what happens to um, their cognition and our gamma rhythms involved? Uh, and then, of course, if so, can we correct cognitive deficits by targeting gamma oscillations? So we wanted to measure something like prefrontal cortex-dependent cognition in these mice. Um, and so we use a task which is obviously simplified, obviously adapted for mice, but, but kind of captures the same sorts of cognitive domains that we know are very important in schizophrenia. And in some ways, this task captures some of the things that are tested by uh, tasks such as the Wisconsin card sorting task and the switching stroop task. So in this task, mice on each trial are presented with two bowls. Each bowl is filled with a different digging medium. So one might have like wood chip and another might have sand. And each bowl has a different odor. So one might smell like garlic and the other might be scented as coriander. And hidden within one bowl, there's a tiny peanut butter chip, right? So that's the food reward that the mouse is trying to find. And so um, the mouse basically learns that one of these four stimuli, in this case an odor like garlic, tells it where the food reward is on each trial. 
And, and mice are very good at this task. One of the nice things about this task is it's very ecologically relevant, right? Mice are digging and they're using textures and odors to tell them where they're going to find food. So mice actually learn this very, very quickly. Um, so here you can see sometimes this odor will be paired with sand, other times it will be paired with wood chip. The mouse learns that, okay, that's always the presence of garlic um, that tells you where the food reward is. And then once it learns this rule, we can test it on a switch. And we can do different types of switches. And here I've shown an extra dimensional shift, what we call a rule shift, where the, sh the rule shifts from being based on odor to being based on texture. And I'll just note that there's a few things about this that, again, resemble sorts of human tasks and human cognitive domains that are impaired in schizophrenia. First is that the mouse has to kind of monitor how well it's doing. And even after a rule switch, if it keeps following the old rule, right, it'll still be right about half the time just by chance. And so it has to realize that even though it's in some trials correct, it's not doing as well as it could be doing, and that it should change its, its rule and its strategy. The second is that in order to do that, it has to suppress perseverative responses, right? So it has to stop paying attention to the previously successful rules. And the third thing is it has to start paying attention to a set of stimuli that were previously irrelevant, right? So in the first part of the task, the mouse could really just ignore texture altogether, and that's kind of the optimal thing for it to do. And now it has to start paying attention to textures again. So that, those are the sorts of ways in which this task, again, resembles tasks like the Wisconsin card sorting task or switching stroop task. All right, so what happens in these mutant mice? So we measure how well they do by the number of trials it takes them to, to learn a rule, and we say they've learned it when they get 8 out of 10 correct. So um, you can see that normal mice, shown here in black, and, and mutant mice, shown here in blue, they do quite well on learning the initial rule, but basically they have to get at least 8 out of 10 correct, and it takes them something like 12 trials to learn an initial rule. It turns out that the mutants are selectively impaired on these sorts of rule shifts, okay? They have a very, very difficult time on rule shifts, they actually make a preponderance of perseverative um, errors, so it's not that they somehow forget the task. They just keep choosing based on the old rules over and over and over again, even though it's clearly not working as well. Um, it turns out, I won't go into this in detail, they're actually selectively impaired on these sorts of extra-dimensional shifts, and if we test them on interdimensional shifts, they, they don't do, uh, they, they do just fine. They don't exhibit any deficits. And so all of this kind of looks like the kinds of deficits in cognitive flexibility associated with perseveration that, that we see in disorders such as schizophrenia. Once again, this cognitive deficit, like the problems in part of the inner neuron physiology, only appears post-adolescence, okay? So I've told you about uh, what happens at the level of cells and behavior, of course, what happens to gamma oscillations, these sorts of circuit properties that lie in between cells and behavior. So we can implant electrodes at the dorsolateral border of mouse prefrontal cortex and measure electrical activity. Um, and then we can basically look at the amplitude of activity at different frequencies, basically the size of these fluctuations, uh, depending on whether they're slow fluctuations at low frequencies or rapid fluctuations at high frequencies, and then quantify the size of rhythmic activity at different frequencies. And we basically compare a baseline condition to the task condition. And so we can focus on different frequency ranges, such as the gamma frequency um, ranges uh, here. And then we can look at how much does activity go up in each of these um, frequency bands during the task compared to the baseline condition. And again, uh, normal mice are shown here in black, and the mutants are shown here in blue. And what do you see, whether we're doing like a rule shift task, or we can do other prefrontal dependent tasks, like a social interaction task. Consistently, we find that these sorts of tasks recruit big increases in normal mice in power in the gamma frequency range. But these gamma frequency oscillations that are recruited by these tasks are deficient or even absent in the mutant mice. And once again, these deficits only appear post-adolescence. Okay? So basically what I've told you so far is that things look kind of interesting in these mice. Post-adolescence, they have the coordinated appearance of problems in their part of the inner neurons, problems with gamma oscillations, and problems with prefrontal dependent cognitive tasks involving switching and, and flexibility. And these kind of you know, look like the sorts of phenotypes that we see in disorders such as schizophrenia, at least a, a subset of them. And you know, they all appear at once, suggesting that there is some causal relationship between them. And that's sort of what we really wanted to nail down. So one way to do this would be to try to, of course, correct these cognitive deficits by targeting gamma oscillations to really establish a causal role for these inner neuron driven gamma oscillations in these cognitive domains. And so the way we do this is, is by taking advantage of optogenetics. Now, many of you have um, heard of optogenetics. This is when, when Tom Insel said that very nice thing about me, which I hadn't heard before. He basically said that probably because I work with optogenetics. Op optogenetics is kind of old news now in neuroscience, so my day is probably over. But um, I'll still get some mileage out of it for a few more years. 
So the reason optogenetics is so amazing is it's allowed us to do um, experiments that were never possible before. And they really, uh, you know, are kind of mind-boggling. So uh, in addition to working in Carl's lab, I also um, worked in a clinic with him, which, which may or may not have been a good idea. And so we would see um, patients together, uh, and he would... Uh, you know, he often saw a, a lot of folks with um, anxiety and, and autism spectrum disorders. And we saw one young man uh, who, you know, a uh, really bright, uh, thoughtful guy, and he came in and said one day, you know, I've been talking about your work, uh, Dr. Dysaroth, to some of, um, some of my friends, and I was showing them YouTube videos about it. And, uh, you know, it, I was telling them how you take these genes from, my, from algae and you put them in the brains of mice and you use lasers to control their thoughts and, and their actions. And, you know, it's like in an outpatient psychiatry clinic, so it sounds um, a little bit worrisome, but that's actually like the perfect description of what optogenetics is, right? So um, many of you have heard about it before, many of you have heard about it from me, but it still amazes me that optogenetics is a thing and it, and it actually works. Optogenetics takes advantage of the fact that microorganisms like algae have single genes that encode both a light sensor and an ion channel. So, you know, in our eyes, in our, in our photoreceptors, we have rhodopsin. Rhodopsin is coupled, it's a light sensor, but it's coupled via, you know, G protein signaling and many, many other proteins to an ion channel. So there's a lot of different ingredients to get the photon of light to change the activity of the cell. Microorganisms, obviously, you know, are kind of specialized for efficiency. They have one gene which does everything, right? It's a light sensor, sensitive to blue light, and then it allows um, cations like sodium to flow into cells, depolarizing those cells and, and activating them. Um, and so we can take advantage of this kind of uh, discovery together with all the tools of modern molecular biology and put channel rhodopsin into neurons in the brain. And actually we can put it into very specific neurons that we choose and make just those neurons sensitive to blue light. So now when we flash blue light, we can activate those neurons and cause them to spike. And what's really special about light is obviously we can deliver light as quickly or as slowly in whatever pattern we want kind of on demand, right? And so in this way, we could say, pick certain cells out of all the cells in a brain region um, and make just those cells um, sensitive to blue light. And then we can deliver light flashes, again, exactly when we want to and in exactly the pattern we want to and say, turn on gamma oscillations in those cells at a specific point in time, okay? And so that's the strategy that we're going to use to try to correct these deficits in gamma oscillations and see how they impact behavior. We do this in behaving mice, so we implant a tiny fiber optic into the brain region of interest. Um, this turns out not to be um, really problematic for those mice. This is just a video, this is an old video um, from when I was in the Dyersbach lab of a mouse. You can't even see the fiber optic very well because it's very thin. The mouse is running around. It's actually getting blue light stimulation right now. Um, it's doing this social behavior task. And there's some subtleties here, but the mouse overall is, is pretty normal and not overly bothered by this manipulation. So we're going to do this while these mice are doing these rule shifting tasks. And um, so basically, we put a channel rhodopsin into the prefrontal cortex into inhibitory interneurons. We've subsequently done this experiment again, putting it just into part of the interneurons and, and see the same thing as what I'm about to tell you. So on day one, we'll have a bunch of mutant mice. They'll do an initial association and then a rule shift. And again, they should have a really hard time with this rule shift. Then on day two, um, they'll do a new initial association. After they finish their, that initial association, we turn on the blue light and we'll actually flash it at 40 hertz, right? So we can, we can flash it at gamma frequencies. And our idea is we're gonna stimulate inner neurons at gamma frequencies and drive gamma oscillations just when mice are doing this rule shift. And then on day three, we, we turn off the light and we have these mutant mice do another initial association and another rule shift. And of course, we have two groups of mutant mice they all should have trouble with rule shifts. One group has channel rhodopsin, shown here in yellow. The other is a control group um, that just expresses uh, a fluorescent protein as a control. That's shown in white. So on the first day, when there's no optogenetic stimulation, all of these mutant mice have a really hard time with the rule shift. They all take many, many more trials than mutant mice in order to complete this rule shift. But on day two, when we turn on the light stimulation, those mice shown here in yellow that have channel rhodopsin, they perform much better on the rule shift, right? They actually perform at levels that are indistinguishable from those of normal mice. And uh, what was very surprising to us was that when we tested these mice again the next day on a new set of odors and textures, the mice that had previously gotten this optogenetic stimulation but were not getting any more stimulation, they continued to perform well. We tested them a week later and they still continued to perform well. So it's as if when we turn on this light 
that these mice have a eureka moment, right? That all of a sudden, this task is not so difficult for them. Like, they get what it's all about. They know how to do it. And going forward, they're able to do it very, very easily. And, and actually, there's some um, literature in, in, in uh, schizophrenia patients that, that kind of looks like this, where, you know, in the Wisconsin card sorting task, for example, um, you know, patients are very, very perseverative. They're very impaired on performance that task. But if you sit down and just explain the rules of the task to them, like, oh, this is a task. This is how it works. You have to do this, this, this. Then, of course, it's, it's very easy. And most of them perform um, the same as normal subjects. And so this is sort of reminiscent of that. But once they get it, they've got it. Um, what's interesting about this is we've tried many patterns of stimulation. So here we stimulate 40 hertz. We also stimulated 60 hertz. That also works. But if you stimulate the same amount but using a combination of frequencies above and below the gamma frequency band, this doesn't work. The mice don't get better. They don't even get a little bit better. They actually get slightly worse. The other thing that's interesting is that if you stimulate different classes of interneurons, so if you don't stimulate parvalvium in interneurons, but you, also, you only stimulate another class called somatostatin interneurons, this also doesn't work. Okay? So the conclusion to this first part is that, you know, there's this idea that dysfunctional parvalvular interneurons cause abnormal gamma oscillations that might drive cognitive deficits. And what we found that really supports that idea is that in mice that, that have these sorts of cognitive deficits, stimulating parvalvular interneurons in order to enhance gamma rhythms can actually lead to improved cognition, actually persistently normalized cognition, so not just a slight improvement. Um, so stimulating these interneurons generates these long-lasting improvements in cognition, and this suggests that perhaps we can correct cognitive deficits in disorders such as schizophrenia, but only if we understand the underlying patterns of activity and then deliver appropriately targeted stimulation. So we kind of had to know that parvalvulin interneurons um, are abnormal, they generate gamma oscillations, the gamma oscillations are abnormal, and then if we target parvalvulin interneurons and enhance their gamma oscillations, then we were able to correct these cognitive deficits. If we do this in the wrong way, then it didn't really work. All right, so I just want to touch for a moment about two kinds of questions that this brings up. Um, one is, it's, you know, I mean, it almost seems like magic that this works so well. So why, what are gamma oscillations doing? Like, I've kind of described them in this very phenomenologic way. Like, there's this thing which happens in the brain. Like, what are they doing that might be so important for brain function? And obviously, we don't know exactly, but there's an experiment that I did um, back when I was a resident at Stanford that speaks to this a little bit. So what we did is we just recorded from an individual neuron, right? And we just injected that neuron with simulated input and recorded its responses. And so we could deliver different patterns of simulated input. Like, we could deliver a pattern that was non-rhythmic, or we could deliver um, input that was uh, rhythmic. And, and in both cases, sometimes the amount of input is high, sometimes it's low. But in this case, it's always sort of modulated at this gamma frequency. And then we can measure how the neuron responds to these different patterns of input. And we can actually quantify the amount of information that these output spikes transmit about the rate of input. So if we count how many spikes there are um, in, in produced by this neuron, can we guess or infer what the level of input was? And it turns out that when you quantify information transmission in that way, the neurons transmit more information about gamma frequency inputs than they do about non-rhythmic ones. And the reason is because it sort of intuitively makes sense. When you pattern things in this rhythmic way, then the pattern of output becomes sort of regular, regularized and less noisy. When you have non-rhythmic input, sometimes the input happens to come all together at once. Sometimes it's kind of spread out. And so it introduces a lot of variability in the rate of output. And it makes it harder to relate the rate of output to the rate of input. So what this means is that neurons effectively pay more attention to inputs that are coming in at gamma frequencies or modulated by gamma frequency um, rhythms. And so if you're a brain region like the prefrontal cortex, right, and you're getting um, input, right, from multiple different sources, and sometimes you have to pay attention to visual input, sometimes you have to pay attention to auditory input, you have to switch between these conditions. Actually, this is not so hard to do because imagine that you have gamma rhythms in the visual input. Well, those are going to be transmitted more um, faithfully by neurons in the prefrontal cortex. So those gamma rhythms are essentially going to cause the prefrontal cortex to pay more attention to the visual inputs. And then if a few seconds later you need to pay attention to auditory inputs, that's fine if you have gamma oscillations now in the auditory cortex, which could be turned on and off very quickly. Now these auditory inputs will become more salient and will be better at sort of entraining um, these neurons in the prefrontal cortex. And the prefrontal cortex will essentially pay more attention to those auditory inputs. So this is a way to flexibly reroute basically information flow in the brain, cause regions to essentially rewire like who they're paying attention to, which inputs are important, which outputs are maybe more important, okay? 
So <clears throat> the other part of this that's a little bit vexing is like, well, optogenetics is really cool scientifically. Obviously, can't do that in humans. Maybe not now. Maybe not ever. Um, so what could we try to enhance gamma oscillations in humans? And so we also use low doses of a benzodiazepine, clonazepam, um, in these mice. And we actually use subangiolytic doses of clonazepam, right? So whenever we use this drug, we use it for sedation or, you know, to relieve anxiety. But in these mice, we use really, really low doses. And so this is just um, an assay of anxiety behavior in wild type and mutant mice, depending on whether they get the drug or don't. And you can just see that the anxiety behavior in these mutant mice, they are um, a little bit anxious, um, doesn't change as a function of this very low dose of clonopin. But when we give this low dose of clonazepam, um, we actually take mutant mice receiving vehicle, and now the mutant mice that are getting clonazepam, they learn a rule shift um, in a normal number of trials. So the sub dose of clonazepam is actually, just like the optogenetic stimulation, able to normalize their behavior. And it does so, we think, because we once again see this profound increase in gamma oscillations in the mutant mice that receive clonazepam, shown here with this sort of shading, compared to the ones that don't, shown with these solid blue bars. Okay, so there may be ways, actually very simple ways, to enhance gamma oscillations um, in patients. You can also imagine things like biofeedback or medication might be effective for this um, that might also have um, pro-cognitive effects. And this is something that um, Damien and I and Dan Mathlon and others have thought about. It, it could be something that would be relatively straightforward to do it and test in a clinical setting. Okay. So that's really uh, about uh, the, the biggest story I'm going to talk about. Now I'm going to very quickly touch on two other stories that deal with circuit activity at different scales, both larger and smaller. And the first um, project I'm going to talk about is this DARPA Subnext project that a lot of you have heard about. This is a, a huge collaboration. It's part of the Brain Initiative. Um, there's about 10 or 12 different PIs at, at you know, four or five different universities involved. Um, here at UCSF, um, the lead PI is Eddie Chang, who actually gave Brain Rounds maybe a couple years ago, talked a little bit about this project. He's a neurosurgeon, um, works with patients with epilepsy. Um, and there's a couple of other people, Phil Starr is involved with this. Um, so it's Savis, um, who's a primate electrophysiologist, is involved with this here. Um, so there's multiple PIs here, a lot of people at Berkeley, Lawrence Livermore. And SUBNET stands for Systems Based Neurotechnology for Emerging Therapies. Obviously, it just sort of made up to have a nice um, acronym. But the description from the original call um, is that this was to create an implanted closed loop diagnostic and therapeutic system for treating and, and possibly even curing neuro neuropsychological illness. So this is, again, fairly broad and, and vague. And, and really, this call was created in response to the fact that a lot of the trials for things like youth brain stimulation and depression were not panning out maybe as had originally been hoped for. And perhaps this was because, you know, we really needed to not just stick an electrode in one very um, fine spot in the brain and stimulate. Maybe we needed to also be recording and based on what we we're recording from the brain, fine tune our stimulation um, and maybe deliver stimulation in a way that was not designed to target very, very narrowly defined regions, but target a much larger network, subnets, whatever you want to call them in the brain. That's the general idea and motivation behind um, subnets. So um, my lab has been involved in a very narrow part of this, and, and this is work I'm going to tell you about that was started by a graduate student, Francisco Longo, who has since graduated and has been continued by um, a great postdoc, Lowry Kirkby, um, who actually used to be a physicist um, before um, kind of venturing into neuroscience. And our idea was to take these patients who are in the EMU, the epilepsy monitoring unit, and having their brain activity recorded for something like a week and look at these um, patterns of brain activity and basically identify within those recordings what are the major features, what are the major patterns that occur over and over again. And this was just based a little bit on uh, my intuition as a psychiatrist, which may or may not be um, on point here, but I, I sort of said, look, you know, I'm, I'm a psychiatrist. I, I like to think I'm a pretty good psychiatrist. And I, I think like, like you guys, you know, a patient walks in the room and I think that even before we go through the whole interview, like I have a general sense for how they're doing, right? So they walk in the room based on their gait, based on their facial expressions, the way they're talking, their posture. You get a sense, are they doing better? Or are they doing worse, right? And, and sort of what that told me is that, look, things like mood, like subjective sense of well-being, these are not minor features of brain activity. They influence almost everything about brain activity. And so if you look for just what, in an unbiased way, what are the big features of brain activity, those should have some correlation with mood, right? Or anxiety or some, something along um, this, uh, these many dimensions. 
And so that was basically the intuition. So the idea was, let's not start off by looking for things that are correlated with mood or anxiety or some very specific measure. Let's just look for major features of brain activity in these large-scale recordings, and we're going to guess that some of those are going to end up being correlated with mood or anxiety. Okay? And I've, I've been very vague and kind of put mood in quotes because we, we haven't gone into a fine-grained analysis of exactly what aspects of mood or anxiety we're, we're measuring. We're just kind of looking at a very global, very rough measure to start with. Okay, so how do we do this? So we have these ECOG recordings, and this is just an example of four electrodes. There are really, in every patient, at least 100, sometimes hundreds of electrodes. Those are scattered over something like 10 brain regions, right? So there'll be a grid, um, you know, there'll be um, depth electrodes uh, in the amygdala and hippocampus and the orbital frontal cortex. Um, there'll be some electrodes in the cingulate and insula all over the brain. There's um, these electrodes. And so this is really like weeks of, like a week of recording continuously from, you know, hundreds of electrodes. It's like way too much data. So you kind of have to reduce this data somehow. And so I'll, I'll tell you about a little bit about the detailed method we use for doing that. It's okay, you know, not to get the, all the details here. So basically the first thing we do is we calculate coherences as a function of time. And what coherence measures is basically if you have two electrodes, right, um, and there's rhythmic fluctuations at a particular frequency in both electrodes, how well are those correlated? So in other words, if, you know, 40 hertz activity goes up in one electrode, does that predict that 40 hertz activity is going to go up in the other electrode at the same time? That would be highly coherent or not. And so coherence is defined for electrode pairs. So basically we have all these electrodes in different regions, subtemporal gyrus, amygdala, hippocampus, OC, singular insula. We have the same electrodes in the same regions here. And so we have this matrix, and each square would represent coherence at a particular frequency at a particular point in time. And we can basically measure how the coherence at a particular frequency changes over time. This gives us sort of a, a time series of coherence matrices. Now each of these matrices is sort of a pattern of network activity. And so we, we do some kind of dimensionality reduction, which basically means, you know, we have, you know, huge numbers of these matrices, right, because we're recording for like a week at a time and calculating one of these matrices, you know, something like every minute. So we can just look at patterns, like this pattern right here, and ask, do these patterns tend to recur? And can we identify which patterns tend to recur the most often, right? That's essentially what you do when you do something like dimensionality reduction. So we do that, and we identify particular patterns using independent components analysis combined with principal components analysis that tend to recur. And we call each of these patterns an intrinsic coherence network. That's just a made-up word, but basically an in intrinsic coherence network is one of these patterns that tends to recur over and over again in this time series of coherence matrices at a particular frequency. And so it turns out that even though we're generating one of these coherence matrices like every minute for something like a week continuously, there's something like eight to ten of these patterns that really dominate the picture. Those eight or ten patterns kind of recur over and over again. And so we're, we kind of figured that, oh, these are these major features of brain activity, and maybe we can look at these dominant ICNs and ask, do any of these correlate with something like mood or anxiety? So, um, so this is sort of, sort of shows what activity in one of these networks looks like. So basically, this, these are three different ICNs, and we basically measure the degree to which at each point in time, activity is similar to this pattern or this pattern or this pattern. And so the degree to which activity is similar to this first pattern is plotted here in blue as a function of time. This one's plotted in green. This one's plotted in red. And we, we noticed something here, which is that, you know, obviously you have these, like, baseline level of activity, and you have these very brief, transient um, transitions to very high activity that then kind of return back to baseline on, almost immediately. And there's some periods of time where you might have a lot of these transitions, so like here for the green network, or you know, maybe here for the red network. And there's other times when you don't have a lot of these transitions, right? So like the lines are pretty flat for the, the green and the red network um, here, okay? So these networks, you know, their activity goes up and down over time. It tends to go up and down in this interesting way, and we quantify that just by calculating the variance of activity in each of these networks over time. So when there's a lot of these spikes, the variance will be high. When these, the activity is very low, the variance will be low. And then we ask, does variance in these networks basically correlate with some very rough measure of mood or anxiety? So we measured that using IMS. So basically, patients have an iPad. And on that iPad, we worked with um, Posit Science, um, which is um, Mike Merzenich's company, to make an app, which basically asked a bunch of questions that we drew from like the PHQ-9 and G, uh, GAD-7. So again, a very um, kind of a not specific measure of just general uh, sense of well-being. And so patients do this. Some patients do this like 
two or three times a day. Some patients did it like once during their entire hospital stay. Um, we weren't really super rigorous about this. Um, this was sort of a first pass. And so we get some uh, measures of subjective mood, um, and then we can correlate that with activity in these different ICMs, these different networks. And for each patient, we basically found one network that turns out to correlate pretty well with this general measure of mood or anxiety. Then we started looking at what these networks were. And this turned out to be very interesting. So you could see that the mood correlated network in this patient has this big black spot here. This correlates corresponds to coherence between the amygdala and hippocampus. This patient also has this big black spot that corresponds to coherence between the amygdala and hippocampus. So does this patient, so does this patient, um, so does this patient, and so does this patient. So in every case, when we just kind of pulled out the, the network that correlated the best with this general uh, measure of mood and anxiety, that network was dominated by coherence between the amygdala and hippocampus. And it turns out to be specifically within the beta frequency range, okay? So then we just took, for all the patients, the um, beta frequency amygdala hippocampus coherence, and we plot that against their, um, their IMS score, their sort of uh, self-report of subjective well-being. And we found this incredibly strong um, correlation. And so each symbol here is a different patient. And you can see this correlation is not driven by just one patient or two patients that happen to have a lot of points. It's actually present across all the patients. And we have something like 10 patients now. And in every, almost every, I think there's one patient in which this doesn't really hold. But when you pull all the data together, it's an incredibly strong correlation. And it, it holds uh, for almost every case on an individual patient level as well. And so essentially, um, we found this measure uh, inside the brain that correlates in real time with subjective mood report. And you know, we've been looking at this in a little bit finer detail. So you can basically say like, okay, well, what about, what, what happens as I change the window over which I calculate this measurement of brain activity and, and shift forward or backward in time from when the patient actually rated their mood? Um, and what you see is that the time scale over which this measurement seems to reflect mood seems to be something like 10 to 20 minutes. And you know, it seems to be that you know, if you use a, a window of about 10 to 20 minutes, you get the strongest correlation, and it tends to hold for about you know, 20 or maybe um, you know, uh, 10 or 20 minutes in the past, maybe a little bit at 30 minutes in the past, and then it kind of dies out. And so this is sort of, if you were thinking about some correlative, just spontaneous mood fluctuations in the brain, um, this is sort of a, what we thought was a reasonable time scale. This is not something which is super sensitive over seconds. Um, this is not something which is you know, enduring over days. Um, this seemed like a reasonable time scale for, again, spontaneous fluctuations in mood for patients who are essentially sitting in a hospital bed, um, you know, waiting to, to have surgery uh, when, when their locus and their seizures is found. So just to summarize this part, we looked at large-scale patterns of activity in the brain, and, and these were relatively tractable. Um, we actually found something like a real-time neural biomarker for mood. Um, again, mood is in quotes here because it's, this is a very rough measure, not very specific. Um, and that, of course, raises the question of what exactly we're measuring, you know? And I think that's obviously an important question. And this is a very specific patient population under a very specific clinical condition, um, right? These are patients with uh, you know, medically intractable epilepsy who are in the hospital. Um, obviously, they're getting different kinds of pain medication. But you know, this is not an unreasonable patient population to study. About 40% of these patients have you know, with something like major depression. Um, you know, uh, there's obviously a huge amount of comorbidity. When they're in the hospital, they're having a decent amount of fluctuation in their mood just because they're, you know, they're anxious about um, their surgery and about their hospital stay. Um, so this is essentially where we're at. It's very exciting. Um, you know, we're obviously thinking about how to combine this with the other part of this program, the, the main focus of subnets, which is brain stimulation. So how might you stimulate in order to correct mood? How does that relate to this biomarker? Do you use this biomarker to trigger stimulation? Would stimulation move this biomarker? These are all questions that, that we're actively working on um, with Eddie and with others um, who are uh, more involved on the stimulation side of things. All right. So uh, now in the last five minutes or so, I'll just very briefly talk about a third story. And this story is motivated by the observation um, uh, you know, from Mass State's group and, and many others that uh, there seem to be some certain patterns of convergence in autism genes. And can we leverage this to start thinking about how circuits are involved in autism? So uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure most of you are familiar with this study, which uh, looked a few years ago at what was then a smaller number of autism genes and found that they seem to be convergently expressed at a specific point in time and space. So you know, within these deep layer networks um, in excitatory neurons in frontal and, and prefrontal regions um, at, at a specific point um, in fetal development. And so 
finding this, of course, suggests that there's something going on in that brain region that's important for autism. And so the question is, what's happening in those circuits, uh, these microcircuits in deep layers of the prefrontal cortex that might contribute to autism? And what we'd like to do is we'd like to have some signature of a cognitive process that is relevant to autism, and we'd like to look at how that is altered in these very specific circuits in, say, mouse models of autism. Now, when we think of autism, you know, we often think, obviously, of social behavior. We think of repetitive behaviors. And, you know, there's not really, like, a, a neural signature of, of those behaviors that we could start with and look at how it's altered. But autism, obviously, involves a major comorbidity, problems with attention, right? About 50% of uh, kids with autism spectrum disorders would also need criteria for ADHD. Many of them are obviously being treated um, uh, with stimulants for uh, attention problems. And so we wanted to see, like, if we, if we could find a neural signature for attention, would that be altered in the setting of autism? And it turns out there are some ideas from systems neuroscience about signals that might be relevant to attention. And basically, multiple studies looking at visual cortex of primates have found that there seems to be this decorrelation in neural activity that's associated with attention. So if you record from two neurons in the visual cortex, they're spiking. And when the, the monkey is paying attention to the region of visual space that corresponds to those two neurons, their spiking becomes more desynchronized or out of sync. So let me just give you some intuition for why this might be related to attention. It seems a little bit counterintuitive, perhaps. So imagine you're um, trying to have a conversation on your cell phone, and you're in, a, like, a big stadium, right? And, you know, if everyone around you is kind of having their own independent conversations with each other, which is usually what's happening, it might be a little bit difficult, but you can probably have that conversation on your cell phone. But imagine that everyone in the stadium is not having an individual conversation. They're all singing in unison or chanting, right? That's going to completely drown out whatever you're listening to on your cell phone. So it's not how loud everybody's speaking. It's the fact that everyone is correlated and singing the same thing, which makes it impossible to pay attention to an incoming signal, or everyone is doing their own thing and decorrelated. And then you, you can actually make out that incoming signal. So this is very, very much the same um, kind of idea that's thought to be relevant to neuronal signal processing, that if neurons have spontaneous activity, and that spontaneous activity is highly correlated, then that essentially gives rise to correlated noise that drowns out incoming signals and makes it impossible to attend to those incoming signals. So it's to believe that when circuits are essentially in an attentive, attentive state, that, that they become decorrelated. The spontaneous activity becomes decorrelated between neurons. And it's thought that acetylcholine actually mediates this kind of decorrelation. Okay? So our idea was to look in sort of isolated, deep layer prefrontal circuits, look for this kind of acetylcholine-driven decorrelation, and evaluate what happens to that in mouse models of autism. All right? So um, for our first question was, can we observe this sort of cholinergic modulation, this sort of acetylcholine-driven decorrelation process? So, um, and then ask if that's altered. So uh, in order to look at this, we used um, calcium imaging in brain slices. So we uh, genetically engineer a neuron so they express um, a protein that fluoresces when there's more calcium in the cell. And so when neurons become active, calcium flows into the cells and the cells fluoresce. And I think Scott Wilkie, who's using this technique in my lab, has, has given a talk and shown some of this data before. But these are what these movies look like. So here we're looking at something like 100 neurons, and you can see some of them are flashing at high rates. They're flashing on and off depending on when they become active. And so we can use this method basically identify where there are neurons um, in the brain slice, record their fluorescence trace over time. Um, it's usually kind of flat. And then there are these red um, periods that we've identified. These are events when they kind of flash, and these neurons are presumably active. We can do this for something like 100 neurons and make a raster. So each of these little black ticks um, represents when a neuron becomes active. One row is one neuron. So these are all the different neurons, and this is their activity over about an hour. And then we can basically measure, hey, if we have two neurons here, how correlated is their activity, right? How often do they kind of flash at the same time? And we can construct a distribution of all the correlations, right? And so um, this is what that distribution might look like. This is just a cumulative plot. So this is the different levels of correlation. These are stronger, more positive correlations. And this is a cumulative distribution. So the mean of this is some weak positive number. So there are these weak positive correlations between most neurons. There's a few neurons that have strong positive correlations. So just as a control, we shuffle the data, right, so we can shift the activity of each neuron over in time by a random amount. That should break the correlations. And so when you do that, you see that this distribution has shifted to the left 
meaning that all the correlations become much weaker. You can count how many of the correlations exceed some threshold, like 0.15, and call those strong correlations, and plot like how many strong correlations are there in the data set. What you see is that the real data contains, you know, about three or four percent of the neuronal pairs have strong correlations. That's essentially zero in the shuffled data. You can also scramble these, which is shuffling in another way, and see the same thing. Okay, so the point is you can, you can make these movies and you can see that neurons exhibit some correlated activity. You can measure those correlations and you can measure changes in those correlations just by plotting the correlation distribution and seeing whether it shifts to the left or the right. The left would be weaker correlations. The right would be stronger correlations. All right, so the first thing we did is we watched on not acetylcholine but a drug that activates acetylcholine receptors, um, Carbacol. So we watched on Carbacol in normal um, brain slices from normal mice and we see that the correlations become weaker. So the distribution shifts to the left. If we measure the incidence of strong correlations, we see that that goes down markedly in Carbacol compared to uh, another solution which just has high potassium. So lax Carbacol and acetylcholine receptors are not being activated as much. So then we wanted to look at what happens in mouse model of autism. And obviously, you know, if you look in one mouse model of autism, you're going to find all kinds of things. And some of those things will have to do with autism and some, some will not, of course. And so what we wanted to do was to look at multiple mouse models of autism and really look at models that were as different from each other as possible. And so we chose two models. We chose the fragile X mice, which model fragile X syndrome, which is, of course, this uh, inherited syndrome that's a major, uh, it's like the largest, you know, uh, single gene um, cause of autism. And then we looked at mice that had an environmental exposure that model autism. So we looked at mice that were exposed to valproic acid in utero. Um, in utero exposure in, in humans to valproic acid is associated with a markedly increased rate of autism. It's interesting when you look at the papers, the epidemiological papers, I mean, the old days, um, offspring of, of mothers who would use valproic acid in pregnancy was something like maybe 15, 18 percent had, you know, autism spectrum disorder. Um, in more recent studies, it's, it's much lower. It's like 3 to 5 percent, which is still markedly elevated. Obviously, over time, as the risks of valproic acid use have been recognized, the amount of exposure in pregnancy has gone down. So even moms who use, probably use much less and, and for a shorter period of time. Anyway, uh, valproic acid exposure in pregnancy is associated with an increased rate of autism, and mice or rats that are exposed to autism at a very, or to valproic acid at a very specific time point in pregnancy, um, the offspring um, have an autism-like syndrome. So we figured, hey, one of these is a model of genetic syndrome. One of these is a model of an environmental exposure early in development. These are really different um, models of autism. So let's see what they show with respect to this ability of cholinergic modulation to decorrelate cortical circuits. So what we find is that whereas in normal circuits, um, when you have carbacol and activated acetylcholine receptors, the correlations shift to the left and there are fewer strong correlations, um, you don't see that in these two autism models. In fact, uh, you kind of see the opposite uh, at a non-significant level in the fragile X mice and at a significant level in the valproid exposed mice. In these cases, carbacol actually increases correlations in the circuit um, and you get many more strong correlations and, and a rightward shift of this distribution. Okay. So uh, this is uh, just a very simple example of how we might develop an assay to measure the function of microcircuits and then use that assay to look for microcircuit phenotypes that might be shared across multiple etiologic factors linked to something like autism. And this represents something which is not just random. It's not just that, oh, these two models share this one feature and it, this feature is just something weird and we don't know what it means. This is actually a circuit function that makes sense if we think about the prevalence of attention deficits in autism and what we know about the neurophysiology of attention that it seems to involve neuronal decorrelation. Of course, this raises all sorts of um, questions. Can we look at maybe behaving mice, performing attention tasks? see the similar kind of decorrelation, um, how might we remediate this? this, these are the kinds of things that we're thinking about right now. So that's pretty much the end of the talk, and again, I just want to go back to this idea that, you know, circuits are obviously important for understanding the brain and thinking about um, psychiatric disorders. We could think about circuits at many different scales, and so I've tried to give examples of three different scales here, talking at the end about microcircuits, kind of pairs of, of neurons or small groups of neurons and their correlations, um, this mesoscopic scale, like maybe groups of neurons that generate these synchronized patterns of rhythmic activity, and then uh, how that might be important for schizophrenia, and of course the macroscopic scale, which is only possible because we uh, are fortunate to collaborate with a neurosurgeon who's putting electrodes all over the human brain. We can visualize these really, really large scales and look at network activity and how it might change depending on whether uh, patients with epilepsy are feeling more or less depressed. 
Um, so I just want to acknowledge again the people who did this work. Um, Kathleen Cho led the first project on gamma oscillations. Um, Lowry Kirkby and Francisco uh, Longo uh, led the second project. Francisco, uh, as a graduate student, also did the third project, the one on um, decorrelation in mouth models of autism. And uh, the first project, of course, is a collaboration with uh, John's lab. And the second one uh, was part of the subnet project being led by Eddie Chang. And it's all analysis of data that, that he's collected from patients in the EMU. So thanks. No, we, we calculated ICNs for different frequency bands. So, yeah, the question was, you know, these ICNs, these um, uh, intrinsic coherence networks, essentially the independent components of the coherence matrices over time, um, were those calculated only using beta frequency activity? And the answer is no. We used different um, frequency bands, and then we basically used an elastic net to ask which frequency band does the best at predicting IMS, and uh, it's the beta frequency band, and so that's why we focused on it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so the question uh, is whether beta coherence has some maybe significance on its own or whether it's just a general measure of functional connectivity measured using other things like fMRI. So, uh, you know, our impression is we haven't done fMRI in these patients, but obviously we can look at the networks we identify in different frequency bands and just ask, look, are we identifying the same networks over and over again, which is just a frequency band? It adds a little bit, maybe in the signal to noise, but isn't changing things dramatically. Or maybe the, these, these are actually really different. The answer is sort of in between. Obviously, if you look at the beta band and the alpha band, the networks are pretty similar. If you look at, say, the beta or delta band and the gamma band, the networks look completely different. Um, beta and, and uh, delta are kind of next to each other. Gamma is really far away. And alpha and beta are next to each other. So there is frequency-dependent information here. Um, why beta in particular seems to be associated with maybe this worsening of mood. You know, one can speculate. Um, it's very interesting, of course, because Phil Starr is involved in this project. He studies patients with Parkinson's. Many of them have um, depression. Beta frequency activity in frontal striatal circuits is a major feature of Parkinson's disease. And so there's this overly simplified idea that, oh, these beta oscillations are bad in some respect. You know, obviously that's a simplification, but beta frequency oscillations may kind of be in this range where, uh, unlike, say, gamma, which is kind of too high frequency to be to induce widespread synchronization, they can induce widespread synchronization and push the network into a state in which it gets maybe stuck, and maybe that's a bad thing. So th th this last part is totally speculative, but I do think there's some frequency-specific information there. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah, this, these mice don't have, they have abnormal social behavior related gamma oscillations. They don't actually have abnormal social behavior just grossly. It's sort of like they socialize for normal amounts of time. Um, so we didn't, we weren't able to really assess that. Um, we, the dose of clonazepam we used is the same as they used in that paper. And it's interesting, I mean, that paper is a, so the question was about um, Bill Catterall's work on the model of mouse model Gervais syndrome, which those mice have deficits in the sodium channel that's predominantly expressed in parvalbumin interneurons. Their parvalbumin interneurons are abnormal, and that's thought to drive epilepsy and behavioral deficits. And they show there's a similar low dose of clonazepam rescue social behavior. We can't look at social behavior because our mice don't have deficits in social behavior. Bill's group did look at other tasks besides social behavior, and they weren't rescued by um, low dose clonazepam. So those mice also had some cognitive deficits. Not, not the same task, but they were not rescued, I think. Um, at least they didn't report a rescue, which I assume means they weren't rescued. Um, so I think uh, there's some similarities and some differences, but it's certainly the big theme is similar. Yeah.
Yeah, it does seem, if you just look at those plots that I put up, you can look and say, like, oh, these other frequency bands, maybe low gamma is higher and high gamma is, is deficient. So maybe maybe they're not able to synchronize at these high gamma frequencies. They synchronize at lower gamma frequencies, and that's not quite as good. Um, you know, it, at some point, um, we didn't try to make too much of that because it's hard to really know what the significance of that is, but it does seem like something like that is happening. I, I would say that's a very reasonable interpretation. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah, it's really interesting and surprising because, you know, John Flack has looked at the role of DLX5 and 6 and really elucidated all these important functions of DLX5, 6 and related genes have in the very early development of inhibitory interneurons. And I think before this study, people didn't really think there was much happening at this later point in life. Like, if you just look at the cells, it doesn't look like there's anything, like their properties aren't changing at this late time point. So it brings up a couple of questions. Um, one, of course, is that we saw this in the mouse prefrontal cortex. The mouse prefrontal cortex is relatively late and, you know, it, it, it developed presumably later on in life. And so we wonder, is there some late critical period or late developmental event in the prefrontal cortex that depends on some sort of associated maturation of these parvalgoon interneurons, some more subtle process? And that subtle process is disrupted, right? Some fine tuning of activity that happens only in adolescence. Beth Stevens obviously gave her talk about synapse elimination. Maybe synapse elimination is happening very late in the prefrontal cortex. If you're changing the number of excitatory synapses, you probably have to change the amount of inhibition in the circuit, and that might require really precise fine tuning. And that might be the kind of process that's really sensitive to gene dosage effects. So these are heterozygous mice. So speculating, that's what I would guess is happening. There's some fine tuning of the circuit that's happening late in life that's very um, precise and dependent on gene dosage, and that goes wrong. Yeah, yeah. Uh, So uh, the question, again, is just uh, basically, you know, I talked about this microcircuit phenomenon of attention being associated with neuronal decorrelation, and then I talked about this sort of mesoscopic phenomenon of tasks which require things like attention in inducing gamma oscillations and rhythmic inhibition. And so how does my rhythmic inhibition c contribute or be related to this decorrelation? Is that a fair to, to reconcile? I mean, I'm not going to give a precise answer. What I am going to say is I think in... In general, in neuroscience and psychiatry, we think of inhibition as inhibition, like it shuts down neurons. And I don't think that's what inhibition is doing. I think that when you have inhibitory neurons providing this rhythmic inhibitory input to other neurons in a circuit, it's not shutting those neurons down. It's doing something much finer and sculpting their patterns of responses, perhaps, perhaps enabling things like spike train decorrelation. Um, I've been very interested in that detailed process. We, don't, I don't, we haven't worked all that out yet. But I, I would speculate that something like that is what's happening. And so those are very closely related, would be my guess. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah. More speculation. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so there's a question about, yeah, plasticity and deficits and learning um, in schizophrenia and, and how that might be related to recovery. So obviously, you know, we see some evidence for plasticity, and I would say there's, you can think of plasticity on two different levels, right? So you can think of plasticity as there's, 
plasticity of some pattern of neural activity, and you, you learn some new pattern of neural activity that allows you to do a task. And then there's another level of plasticity, which is a sort of like there's some permanent change in the properties of neurons and networks that they just permanently work better in a much more generalizable way, right? And I think that what we saw was the first kind of plasticity. I think that because if we deliver stimulation in more limited ways, we don't see the same cognitive benefit. We have to deliver it like through the whole task to see that benefit. So I think it's not just that when we stimulate, we're inducing some like cellular plasticity that the network remodels in a way that the network works better. But I do think that that's possible to get, right? And the question is, if you had mice and they were learning a whole bunch of new tasks each week, we taught them a new task, we maybe boosted their gamma oscillations, would that carry over in a really long-lasting way to uh, some overall improvement and recovery, essentially, in those mice? And I mean, that's a, uh, I mean, I think in the clinic, there are these rare patients who are sort of suggestive that that is happening. They're not super rare, they're not super common, but there are patients who have what seems like not a complete recovery, but a long-lasting, very significant improvement in functioning. And I don't, know, I mean, I think there's a little bit of a chicken or egg question, like, is that a special population of patients? Like, they had some special form of the illness they were able to recover from? Or is that a population of patients who had really great support and really great therapeutic, um, you know, offerings and were able to recover? And I, we obviously don't know the answer to that, but um, I, would, I, I think that there's a lot that's possible there in the span of recovery, but it would require some more interven intensive interventions, either like an experimental mouse level or obviously a human clinical level. Yeah, we haven't actually looked at that. It's a, it's a good question. We have looked at um, what dopamine does, um, at least D2 receptors, and they also shift these, decorrel these correlations in a way that is suggestive of decorrelation. They also increase the amount of activity and have other effects as well. But we haven't looked at amphetamine. We, we have looked at specifically activating D2 receptors. That has profound effects on the circuit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so it, the point is well taken, and I think, um, I mean, at a mouse level, we're sort of looking for other mice that have similar cognitive deficits to see if the same intervention helps them. But um, it's true that, you know, if you're trying to remediate cognitive deficits in schizophrenia, there are a lot of other issues that might stand in the way. Even if you, even if gamma oscillations are one part of the um, picture and you remediate those, it might be that you, you don't see as big of an effect because there's still, like, a lot of other things going on. But there might be more circumscribed um, kind of cases of executive dysfunction that might be more amenable to this kind of treatment. Or, you know, you might see bigger effects maybe in, I don't know, like early stage dementias or something like that um, that might be focused on the frontal lobe and frontal pathology. Um, and that's certainly something we think about. I haven't, like I said, we'd like to do this in other mice that have similar deficits and see how generalizable um, this effect is. Um, and that's something we're working on right now. So. Yeah, Matt. Yeah. 
Yeah. This, this, this is a great question about like the kinetics of GCAMP and what that tells us about what we're really measuring. So GCAMP is relatively slow on the time scale of neurons and firing, right? So this original observation with the correlation was seen by measuring spiking activity, and GCAMP is an indicator that turns on and off, you know, on a time scale of 100 or hundreds of milliseconds. So it probably, when we see these bouts of activity, that's probably indicating that not that a neuron is firing a spike or two, but that it's gotten recruited into some really big pattern of activity. And so we're looking at correlations that are on a different time scale, maybe one or two orders of magnitude slower than the correlations that occur at the level of single spikes. Um, we do have some ideas about how to get around that. So I think that, you know, I showed these GCAM movies where basically you identify these events and you label them as red. There's a lot of sub-threshold signals, and those are real signals. I mean, those are coming from calcium fluctuations and changes in fluorescence that no, you know, people generally throw away. I think there are ways to take advantage of those sub-threshold fluctuations um, that we're doing right now in other studies and calculating correlations based on those sub-threshold fluctuations. You can actually also find behavior, like you can find changes in correlations that correlate with behavior, basically. Um, so I do think there's more information, but what I talked about here, that, that's a slow time scale decorrelation. Now, that's, I just want to say one thing. I think that's actually appropriate for this assay because the question is, is spontaneous activity correlated or decorrelated? And spontaneous activity tends to be driven by these large, like kind of up states, down states that, that tend to have slow time scales. And so I, I think that it's re if you were basically asking, if spontaneous activity gets correlated or decorrelated, this is reasonable. But if you want to look at correlations related to a task that was on a much faster time scale, this wouldn't be good. Yeah. All right. Did anyone else have a question? Um, yeah, Marty. Yeah, well, um, first of all, thank you for uh, saying those analyses are, are good. We should talk to some of our reviewers who don't always agree, but um, <laughs> that's the nature of science. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I, I don't know that there's very specific, like, single things that I take from the science to the clinic, but I definitely, you know, it definitely makes me, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I definitely think about these issues of cognitive deficits in a much more specific way than maybe I did before. You know, I've always been fascinated by, for example, the way in patients with psychosis, and a lot of different kinds of psychosis, they can be perseverative and tangential almost at the same moment in time. And when you really start to think about these two processes cognitively, they seem like the opposite of each other, but we're trying in some of our studies to try to identify situations in which in mice we get what looks like perseverative and tangential or disorganized behavior kind of coexisting. Um, so I, I would say that you become, a, like there are these moments where you, I notice things like that and I'm like, you know, how does that happen? That seems odd and maybe we can um, tease that apart a little bit more and understand where it comes from. So that's the best example I can give of that. All right, well, uh, maybe it's a good point to break. Thank you.